Trapped under the curse of the tower, Hyunwoo Kim is the strongest hunter of them all. But no matter what, it wouldn't let him leave. One day, out of absolutely nowhere, the world itself was thrown into the frying pan as monsters came from thin air. All around the globe, towers began to raise from the ground, monolith structures that put governments and citizens into panic. The self-called tutorial towers would drag unknowing victims into their dark halls regularly, with the only option of escape being to clear it. No matter the age or physical condition, if you were chosen, there was only one way out, up. Just wish they'd installed an elevator, you know? Among the 20% of those who survived the tower and its harsh battles, one person would become the savior of mankind. 12 years later, as the world had acclimated to the towers, monsters became nothing short of an annoyance for the authorities with the introduction and adoption of hunters. These hunters would often be on the same popularity bar as idols and would be treated as such, with all the cameras and ugh, paparazzi that come with it. As hunters began to strengthen in numbers and fame, the governments of the world could not ignore their mighty military capabilities, and thus the number of hunters soon became a part of a nation's power. To protect themselves from these nations and some laws, hunters began to raise their prices and move together as an association, or by common fantasy terms, a guild. Now we join the live broadcast of a TV show, Knowing the Hunter where curious fans submit questions and receive news on the activities of their favorite hunters or guilds. During its time on air, the show managed to rake in a 35.7% viewer rating and became widely established as a popular program. This week, three of the top guild leaders in Korea are with them on air. Leader of the Goguryeo Guild, Seo Kwon Han. Leader of the Arangs Guild, Seo Yeon Lee. Finally, leader of the Seoul Guild, Shi Hyun Kim. During the last minutes, the guildmasters are asked one more question about a familiar face. The top question on the internet at the time. What do they know about the mythical advanced player of the tutorial tower? Uh, wait. Tutorial tower? And only 20% of the people survive? Some tough game this must be. The guild leaders shock their host by claiming that yes, he is real. And if he hasn't died yet, then he must be living the good life inside the tower. The very first hunter who fell in with the leaders and never managed to make it out. They detail that, for some bizarre reason, the first hunter was cursed and no matter what he did, the tower would not let him leave its halls. The escape portal would only send him back to the first floor. When the hostess's shock is over, she asks if they considered him the initial hunter candidate, and the response is a unanimous yes. To the best of their knowledge, he has trained every single ability to the max level with the sole exception of magic. When pressed with the question, is there a chance that he grew into a really powerful hunter? Are you deaf? The leaders claim that according to the reports, he had cleared the entire tower from floor one to 100 within a single day. We fade into the tower and a group of the people trapped inside, screaming for help while running for dear life away from something. We finally get a look at the first hunter as he just casually walks through the crowd like it's a lazy Sunday facing the boss of the 100th floor, Palak. Online speculation circles around this guy and his borderline mythomania status. On the first floor, he'd hit a monster so hard it no-clipped to level 10. With nothing but a kick, the 100th floor boss is brought to kneel. After a minor psychological break, he simply wonders what ending to have the next time. In the last 12 years, clearing the tower has never really been easier with the wealth of information humanity possessed. Each tower was no different from the last, with zero content changes. With each tower clear, more techniques and opportunities showed themselves, and because of the internet, nothing is ever really lost. With worldwide strategies freely available, the world record for clears became something of a sport, and in most cases, all citizens are educated in how to clear each and every room there is. Though no matter how much you prepare, you'll never be ready for the real deal. For coming up into the 99th floor, you reach the so-called zenith of fear, Palak, the tower's owner. The final boss. 70 out of 95 people fear this entity, which by this point had claimed innumerable lives. As a man lies on the floor, staring up into the creature's eyes, Palak gets yeeted back by the body of his minion, which was kicked into his royal highness by none other than the advanced player. The boss dies instantly. So much for fearsome fiery fish face. Stepping through the portal yet again, Hyunwoo Kim marks the 1,350th start of his forever climb up the Endless Tower. 
after a hot minute on the fact that he just can't seem to get out, was shown the impressive status window, where we see he has max stats and even surpasses the stamina limit. A short flashback to 12 years prior shows us his first clear of the tower, the rejoicing moment when everyone believes they can go home. They make merry and jokes, right before Kim passes the portal for the very first time, and arrives back on the first floor. After seeing the curse, Kim can't help but rage out of frustration and terror. As he accepted his new reality, another 10 clears of the tower would follow, trying all kinds of cures that never worked. Probably some things in there he's not proud of. Best not to think too hard. As his power increased over and over, not even the dungeon walls became able to hold him. A single swing and there goes a stone pillar. After 5 years of trial and failure, eventually he deduced that there might not be a cure. Eventually, in half-resignation of his situation, Kim opted to entertain himself by various means. These included acting as an unscripted NPC and being a military instructor meant to help fresh trainees, but eventually it just became painful to watch them leave. Until today, because as Kim looks down to a new bit of text, his hope sparks a wildfire of emotion. The loop has been removed! With bewilderment building up, Kim slowly realizes he can finally leave. After everything he's done, the spell was broken. With a cry of joy echoing the halls, he kneels down and springs to the very top of the tower, rocking the entire structure. The fastest current time to clear the tower has been officially recorded at 10 months. As the guildmasters explain, most of their concerns lay beyond floor 51, where a high level, big threat boss appears on every 10th floor above. Uh, sure, a high level boss. One that totally isn't being mercilessly murdered by the Rising Kim as he blasts through floor after floor. In mere minutes, he faces the Balrog in the teeth and turns his head into a fine red mist. Well, what's left of it after this explosion? As the tower opens to the field made around it, the authorities immediately ready a list of survivors who should be coming out. We learn that this has to be the fastest clear in history. As he's asked for his name and congratulated on leaving, Kim yells and cheers with joyous victory that he's finally broken the curse and come home. On checking the list again, the instructor can't seem to find his name until, on a hunch, he checks the first group to ever enter the tower. I'm sure you can guess whose name he finds. One week later, knowing the hunter is on the scene at the Korean Tutorial Center to witness the 18th group, they single-handedly reduce the world record by two weeks. But the rumor everybody and their mother seems to be interested in is that the mysterious advanced player was present for this. At the Tutorial Tower's VIP waiting room, the guildmasters gather to discuss if their long-awaited friend has finally rejoined them in reality. They eagerly await the test, noting that Kim would be the exact same as when they last met him, as the tower stops both aging and appetite. Down in the training room, Kim is enjoying himself a bag of chips while the trainees are preparing for their test. They all move out as the doors open, beating Instructor David, an A-class hunter, pretty high up there, in front of their challenge. As they are soon told, the entire world is viewing this trial. However, they shouldn't be nervous, as compared to the tower itself, this exam would be an absolute cakewalk. As he starts the operation, it is said that there are many, many difficult challenges that a hunter would face in this world. One of them would be the infamous maze. Living true to its name, the maze is a labyrinth complete with every kind of trap imaginable. The only instruction they are given is to get to the exit, and a 30 second timer begins ticking away. 3, 2, 1. As soon as the exam starts, they rush into the area with great discipline. Kim stays behind and turns to the instructor, asking only a simple question. All he has to do is get to the exit, right? The instructor says yes, but asks if this is how seriously he's going to take the exam. After a pathetic attempt at intimidation on David's part, Kim suggests a bet. 100,001 says he makes it in 20 seconds. The stakes are raised to 1 million one. Kim quickly runs off to the edge of the door, getting giddy about the fact that David's one day of pay and overtime allowance is 10 million one. As his strength rapidly builds with a pulled back fist, David and the world can only watch in glorious wonder as, with one hit, the entire maze has a large hole put through it. I think this player had potted the game a bit too much. One casual stroll later and our boy has arrived at his forcibly made exit. Well, he did go through the maze, so I guess it counts. 
Now his only worry is, will they expect compensation for the uh, damages? It's now 24 hours before the rank assessment assignment. In the office of the live broadcasters, paperwork is being finished up with some gossip about the advanced hunter. Apparently, finding something about him is not so easy as it first appeared. Other than the hunter, would there be anyone else to keep eyes on? Funny you should ask. Yes, there is a backup hunter trained in the traditional martial arts world, Lee Kang Hyun. Seeing him in the dungeon's training, we quickly learn he is overconfident in his abilities. While luck is on his side to make it this far, it sure as hell won't be when squaring off against our boy. He doesn't seem to be in it for anything much more than the fame and fortune. At least, not until he saw Kim's final rampage. Defeating Balak in a single hit? Poor dude felt pathetic in comparison. I mean, who wouldn't? Skipping back to the present, he can only stare in awe as, once again, Kim had beaten him in every conceivable way, punching through the maze to walk to the end like a badass. Staff were scrambling left and right to find a camera with a clearer picture of what the hell happened. Kim being put up on the big screen. Moving to a waiting room, Kim is basically half asleep while the rest of the trainees talk about him in hushed whispers and rumors. An intercom lets them know that the order of today's events have been changed, wishing everyone good luck and godspeed with their trials. Lee vows not to lose to this man. Got some bad news for you, buddy. And we're informed by more jumping perspectives that he was one of the people to come out of the tower with magic. This comes right as he's finishing up the next part of his exam, using lightning from a sword blade to effortlessly beat the living daylights out of hologram goblins. He ends up with a score of 78, which is the highest of all contestants, so far. While he's being praised, we finally have Kim heading into the training room with some stares from TVs all around the world. Now it's time to shine, Kim is called into the test room, Walking lazily into the room, he's glared at by Lee Kang Hyun, a silent but extremely jealous rival who believes he deserves all the fame and glory. As the examiners watch with bated breath, the holographic creatures begin to form and the time is set at 120 seconds, 2 minutes. The announcer begins to count down. Almost the instant he hits zero, a goblin raises its club to strike and promptly has its head taken off. The entire broadcast room goes into a frenzy trying to find footage of what happened. And while Kim keeps taking off heads, the examiners are left in a state of shock at his speed and strength. Kim actually goes so fast that he disappears from view and just keeps killing. Even his old friends, the three guild masters who he got sent into the dungeon with, are baffled by the raw power. Kim is casually moving around to each goblin and taking their head off one by one, then finding the next target to rinse and repeat. He's just doing it so fast that the actions manifest instantly. By the time his two minutes have ended, Kim has racked up 248 points. Assuming a single point per kill, that means he has defeated almost 3 monsters per second. Talk about insanity. Of course, the clips immediately get uploaded to social media and cause a chaos of replies, news reports, and attention to the subject. Lee doesn't really appreciate having his image be overshadowed by some lazy man like Kim, even breaking his phone by way of rage grip and almost destroying the door to his waiting room. Calm yourself, my boy. Calm. Once done with his little tantrum and the poor wall in front of him, Lee has a mental breakdown because Kim got famous without doing anything. Uh, yeah, sure. Try saying that to his face and see where it gets you. While Lee continues his embarrassing moments, Kim has been called into a meeting with the deputy information officer from the Korean Hunter Association. She introduces herself as Alice and hands Kim a form with a long list of parties that wish to meet with him, also saying welcome back after 12 years trapped in that horrible place. While he looks over them, Alice continues to explain that they are always interested in finding elite hunters, and in working together, the rewards can meet an incredibly high ceiling. When his attention returns, Kim asks if it's her job to transfer contracts to the hunters. Apparently it isn't. Alice wants to meet personally with the man who basically broke the internet and disturbed the entire world something fierce. She hands him something else as well, a contract from the Ares Guild for him to look over, and possibly agree to. A contract which on the very back page promises in the hundreds of millions in rewards, easily 10 billion won. Kim thinks for a moment before asking the rather blunt question of when their currency fell so much. Alice says not to worry as there's no form of economic crisis or stuff like that, only that land prices went up. She pulls out her phone and shows him what his old home is currently priced at for reference. Formerly 300 million won, it is now skyrocketed to 1.3 billion with inflation. Needless to say that this contract is an immense deal for him, and provided the Ares Guild wants to keep him, they would be willing to double after expiration of the contract along with renewing it. 
That becomes 20 billion won just for his services. That's very cash money. Kim is smart about this and asks straight up if this is also part of her job, giving him such a contract. Alice admits it's mostly because she has a personal contract and promised she'd at least pass it on for them. Unfortunately for all parties involved, however, Kim never had any intentions of joining such a thing as a guild. While the rewards would be great if he did, it's just not something that he wants to put himself through. Alice comments that this is a really amusing joke, but it's not. His reasoning is that they would never even think about giving something that big out with zero caveats. The amount of unnecessary boring work that would be foisted onto him would outweigh the benefits. Alice tries in vain to have him reconsider, saying that solo mercenary hunters are people who grew through guilds, and it is impossible for a single hunter to explore a maze with no experience. Did she not see what happened to one of those mazes last video? As much as Alice is peeved, even going far enough to call him arrogant, but giving up and telling him to call the number on her card if his mind changes at all. Kim leaves her and heads back to his old home. While lying down with nothing else to do, he decides to read through the list of people who want to meet him. At the very top, he spots three names he recognizes. The guild leaders, his old buddies from the tower. Five days later, at the end of the new hunter's protection period, he's sitting with the three of them in a restaurant. So Kwon Hyung, who is about his age, had become an uncle in looks. Shi Hyun Kim, who is a crybaby in the tower, is now quite the handsome man. And the adorable little girl he remembers, Soyeon Lee, has become a beautiful woman. They are no longer the people he remembers in vivid detail, but full-grown adults. While exchanging stories and catching up on life, the topic comes up that Kim has actually been famous on TV a number of times. The most famous examples were him doing a weird dance in front of a defeated boss, and the inevitable kicking of a beast from the first floor to the tenth. Kim admits that at one point, he did try a few challenges, such as defeating the dungeon boss while dancing. They only stare at him out of concern for mental health, before he admits he only tried it out of sheer boredom. I mean, when you're stuck in the same tower for 12 whole years, you don't get a lot to do besides kick the daylights out of stuff, right? Hearing it from him, it's all they can do to believe the stories, but then comes a tidbit of interesting information. He may have a student somewhere out there. His memories of this are quite vague, but it was in some time he'd spent between the 50th and 60th floors. There's a person who had fallen behind their group, so Kim helped them out by raising them as a student for a while. Though, come to think of it, his personality wasn't the best. Nor was his advice. It was lucky that he wore a mask or he'd totally get sued. After a great day out and catching up with his friends, Kim is back at home in bed and looking over a status window yet again, a mystery to be solved. Oddly, the limit of the tutorial phase had been removed as had the 36 from his age, replaced by 24. Guess that his age really didn't go up. Kim wonders though why the text about the loop being removed was still present though. New instructions catch his eye though. They are looking forward to him clearing three more dungeon bosses to move on to the next level. Uh-oh. Calling it right now? This isn't going to end well. He's also given a list of the areas to clear, but a knock on the door at this late hour catches his attention. One of the caretakers has come to his door, saying that there are a few people downstairs who want to meet with him. A few people from the infamous Ares Guild. Oh joy. Kim requests that they be told to pound sand, and he's not interested in joining any guild, but the caretaker insists as they won't leave without speaking to him. After getting a rough impression of these people from the way the kind old man acts, Kim decides it may just be best to go down and meet with them to preserve the peace. Upon entering the meeting room, he's greeted by two people who look straight out of a mafia movie. One dealmaker sitting in his chair a bit too comfortably and a big beefy bald bodyguard. Kim immediately reminds them that he's not interested in joining any kind of guild, but the relaxed one has the attitude to greet him anyway and hand a business card. Leader of the personnel section of the Ares Guild, Byung Ho Kang. He asks bluntly if Kim thinks this is okay to not join any guild whatsoever, much less the Ares Guild. Kim retorts with a simple but straight question of his own. Did they really come at an hour like this to blackmail him? Baldi acts out with a classic how dare you say that speech. His boss says to calm down and questions if this decision is really in good judgment. Kim cuts him off as he already has the information on them. The Ares Guild had eaten over half the Korean dungeon zones and were a ragtag group of garbage. They charge people expensive fees for entry tickets. And if you want to start your hunter journey or maintain your livelihood, those expensive entry tickets are the only practical way to go. Or you could join the guild. They were forcing everyone between those two options, breaking in the profit from it all. Baldi breaks the table in anger to show the guild's power. Is that supposed to scare him? After destroying the table, Baldi picks it up and throws it to one side. Apparently Baldi is a hunter whose abilities were determined to be above A rank, and Kong is beginning to wonder if Kim can defeat him. Clearly, this guy hasn't read a single manhwa. 
Kim has reached the conclusion that these guys are indeed rotten apples down to the core, and steps up to the challenge with nothing but a slipper as his weapon. Hey, come over here. Get hit and come to your senses. Baldi doesn't take the reality check well and blindly attacks, which gets him a slap hard enough to put his body into a wall, destroying the slipper in the process. A small price to pay for putting a pompous idiot right where he belongs, six feet sideways. When the rubble and dust clears, Kong stares in absolute terror as the biggest, toughest man in their guild hangs limply from his position between the remains of the rock mural. Kong had really thought that bringing the muscle along would intimidate a man like this, but it ended up utterly backfiring. All he could really do at this point is stand frozen with fear wondering what the hell went wrong, and how it all could have come to this. How could such a strong hunter even exist without the use of magic? Kong is broken from his stupor as Kim approaches, stating that the one thing above all else that he really really hates in this world is when he gets threatened. Kim heads out to Xiyun's place to relax a little bit and blow off the steam while enjoying some strawberries. Xiyun warns him that it's best not to be on the end of a grudge with these guys, as they seem to have a nasty habit of killing people within the mazes, where no witnesses are around. While he's present, Kim also starts to gather information on these dungeons that he's supposed to be going into, asking Xiyun if he knows anything about the Institute of Adaron. The Institute of Adaron is a C-rank dungeon in which Kim has business. That is the only explanation his friend, Guildmaster Xiyun, gets when asking why he wants information on it. While Kim enjoys some strawberries, Xiyun explains that the Ares Guild owns that particular dungeon, and are abusing their rights to block entry to non-guild members. Kim shouts that this is absurd and asks what the government is doing to prevent this. Aren't there any antitrust laws or something of the like to stop them? The blunt answer is no. Neither the government nor politicians pay much attention to hunters, as they don't have any say in it. For example, they cannot predict how many people pass through the tower and become hunters. Kim reminds him that they also kill people in the dungeons. Why isn't this considered outright murder? Because it is seen as accidental, explains Xion. And if you look at the Ares Guild as an outsider, they are a new industry, one that dutifully pays their taxes. This is a rather sticky situation in that the authorities can't really meddle with the work of the hunters from outside without stirring the hornet's nest. Kim stands and says that it should be fine if he could just enter secretly somehow. This would be no problem. Xion reminds him that they are guarding the entrances 24 hours a day, so it will be practically impossible for someone not to notice a random hunter walking around. Is that so? Then that leaves him no choice. He'll just have to take the bull by the horns and make his own way in. Uh-oh. He's warned that this would end with the hostile relationship with Ares, but, well, if you look at last chapter, I think it's a bit late for that. We now jump to the Ares Guild HQ, where higher-ups are discussing their expansion of the guild into China. The Pado Guild has evidently become a nuisance, leaving the estimated time of expansion at 5 months. Our first look at one of their higher-ups, branch manager Sun Wu Yu, is very telling of the Ares mindset as he says that you don't need to be faster than the dungeon boss to survive, you only need to be faster than the person in front of you. Not a guild I'd ever join. Next on their list comes the expected abilities of Kim Hyun Woo. Sun Woo does a double take on the clipboard and asks if this is some joke. He's assured that this report was conducted based on the footage from the tutorial zone, using the analytics machine introduced on a trial basis for all the calculation. Sun Woo asks if the machine has a screw loose, and while the director of personnel thought the same thing, no matter how big the error range is, it always stays within one rank by design. They did try to recruit him before finding this, but we all know how that went. Sun Wu says to forget trying to recruit him, as someone like him will only end up causing more problems than he's worth. While it would be a good thing for the guild to recruit him in the short term, Kim may not be satisfied with whatever he gets, and that could be a threat to Sun Wu's position. Rather than recruit such an unruly man, it would be better to give him a so-called injury. The director understands the meaning and vows to take care of it. As he's exiting the room, one of his subordinates rushes up to tell him of an important problem they've had at the Institute of Adaron. I wonder who that could be. At the entrance to said dungeon, the guards are rejecting a cute girl who has no ticket even as she pleads with them to enter. There's no other place to hunt in the area and they know it. The guard approaching her says that he's an oppa of principles, but when he sees her, his heart gets a bit weaker, and he'll let her in for her phone number. Um. Ew. This is where they notice Kim walking up to the gate. Kim tells him that his business lays inside the dungeon, and the guard starts to get annoyed. I'll get the popcorn. The guy tells Kim that if he's going to go mad, do it somewhere else. Kim is silent for a few seconds before taking off his shoe. Uh oh. And saying they don't really get it. Even though he's talking peacefully, they just don't understand. 
He tells the big guard to come here with a smile. The guard is now getting agitated, but before he can finish his sentence, off he goes over the gate from a slipper slap. The remaining guards just look between Kim and the dust cloud behind him, trying his best to process what the heck just happened. With his meathead of a friend now collapsed into some dented metal fence, Kim appears behind him like it's nothing, wanting the guy's shoes. The poor guy doesn't really have a choice in the matter and hands them over to Kim before things get ugly. Our pro tag remarks at how light these things are, despite being made almost entirely of metal. The guy had paid 5 million won to put weight reduction on them. Oof. Meanwhile, at the Soul Guild headquarters, Xion is getting an earful from one of Kim's other old friends in the group, Soyeon Lee. The woman is worried sick about Kim going in there alone and chastises Xion for letting him walk out of there. But he retorts by asking how the hell he was supposed to stop him from walking out, especially when he told Kim the exact same things. Does Yeon think that she could have stopped him in the same situation? She goes silent for a moment upon realizing that he's right. You think? I mean, you try stopping a freight train. Yeon quickly becomes concerned about the Ares Guild next, as Kim already has some bad blood with them because of the beatdown he gave their chief of staff last episode. But Xion couldn't get more detailed info than that. He knows that if Kim keeps still, there wouldn't be a problem. However, the moment there is a breakdown in relationship, Kim gets very angry at the opponent and shows his rather twisted personality. He knows why it's twisted the way it is, but in essence, thinks that they shouldn't really need to worry about Kim if what he told them is true. Yeon asks what he's talking about, and Xion reveals Kim's ability grades to her. The woman stumbles back a little in sheer shock, slowly processing the info she was just given. Going back into the depths of the Adiron Institute, we join a small group of hunters looking to take down the boss Adiron as they develop a strategy. While they do this, Kim casually strolls through the hallways, encountering the big scary monster. They watch helplessly as it notices Kim and is in joy at finding a new research subject. Creepy as heck, but alright. The boss grinds his giant scalpel against the needle of the syringe strapped to his arm, and Kim simply warns him not to do that. Adiron only has a second to ask what he's talking about before the boss's head is taken clean off by a single kick. Kim looks to his menu which confirms the kill of the first required boss, while the group of hunters nearby watch out of bewilderment as the advanced player from the rumors walks away. Somewhere in the basement of the Ares Guild at the executive department's office, management department head Chun Myung Woo gets a surprise visit from the director of personnel. As Chun looks through the file given, he's impressed by Kim's ability ranks and asks if he truly has this much. Director Sun Wu tells him that this is just a temporary analysis, and it's not 100% accurate yet, but it's still incredible, and the strength of a monster. Chun asks if he just has to recruit Kim. Instead, his orders are to give the protagonist a proper injury, though even if Chun does what he wants, there won't be a problem. On further pressing, Sun Wu says that because Kim rooted through their exclusive dungeon and smacked up the guards, the Ares pride was wounded quite a bit. Chun pipes up that since it'll be hard to give someone like Kim an injury, they would do better taking care of the problem discreetly and not involving the branch manager. He has to concentrate on the expansion in China after all. The executive department is also pulling personnel out of the country because of the Pado Guild. Since it was founded two years prior, the Pado have monopolized up to 50% of China's current dungeons. Within only four years of coming out of the tower, they had made the guild huge with the top members all boasting monstrous abilities. The most surprising thing is that the guild leader, someone ranked 5th from all S rank hunters worldwide, is someone who has yet to be identified. Anyway, they shouldn't worry about Kim right now because the executive department doesn't have the men to give him a proper injury. Instead, they will send a carefully selected expert to handle the issue neatly. Meanwhile, Kim is fiddling with the new phone Xion got for him, oogling at the modern technology and how it changed over 12 years. He takes a picture as well, admiring the crystal clear image on screen while Xion wonders if buying him something like this was a good idea. He'd been fiddling with it for the last three hours, now playing a mobile game to pass the time. But on a lighter note, looking at the Forest Village dungeon that Kim mentioned, Xion's very own Soul Guild is the one managing it. At least this time it will be an easy trip to get in. There probably won't be any boss monster though. Kim has to do a double take. What does he mean there's no boss monster? Xion explains that unlike in the tower, Monsters in dungeon just spawn endlessly from predetermined locations. If you kill a boss, however, it takes them quite a lot of time to regenerate. While different for every dungeon, it takes about a month for the forest boss to respawn. But since they caught the boss about 4 weeks prior, he should be up and at him in about 2-3 to three days. Annoyed with the wait, Kim asks if Xion managed to get any info about the other dungeon, the Visible Swamp. But unfortunately, that dungeon is held exclusively by the Ares Guild. If Kim looked properly, he may be able to find some information regarding the place. 
Shun also asks when Kim plans to visit the Hunters Association to register his rank. When Kim asks what it is, the Guildmaster explains that it's to receive benefits, accommodations, and their partner programs. You also get paid from it, but have to accomplish something at least once every 2-3 months to keep the registration. If you get to the top of the chain at S rank, you get around 700 million won a month. Kim and Shun step into the Hunters Association building, finally heading to the Ability Measurement branch to reveal the advanced player's stats to the world. As the investigator hands Kim the measurement device, a small hologram appears next to him, calculating the grades. As the machine finishes its work, Kim sighs in relief and turns to give the staff his tool back, but has to step back in surprise as the guy screams in shock from the readings. Within a mere matter of hours, word is already out about his ability grades, and the internet is eating it up. People are in awe, saying he's practically equal to the first rank hunter. Kim is baffled at how information gets out so quickly in the modern era, different from the 12 years ago when he lived on the outside. Not even a few hours have passed, and the internet is chewing itself to pieces over his rankings. Xi'an mentions how he's the single most talked about person these days, so it's not like there's anything they can really do about it. Ever since he turned the Ares dungeon on its head, a lot of groups have been keeping a very close eye on him. While Kim doesn't seem to care all that much about how he's shaken up the world, Xi'an advises him to stay on his toes as the Ares guild will have collected all that information on him by now. He needs to be careful from now on as the Ares guild are really dangerous people. Meanwhile, Kim is trying not to laugh at something on his phone screen like a child. <sighs> Gonna be harder than he thought. Poor Xi'an. After an awkward moment of silence, Kim asks why Xi'an is escorting him around. Doesn't he have things to do? I mean, So Kwon Hyung and So Yeon, the other guild masters, look very busy. But he seems to have plenty of free time. Xi'an seems slightly annoyed by the question, but answers it anyhow. Indeed, he is also a guild master and has his own responsibilities, but he had made extra time just for his old friend. Deep in the Ares Guild's basement of horrors, Two senior men are having a detailed look into Kim's rank, and one is practically fainting on sight. The chief of their executive department says that he's a pure-blooded monster with ranks that high. No wonder the branch manager above them both wants this guy dead. The executive chief tells his friend who looms over the document not to worry so much. They called Chun Kang Xin, a massive mercenary who will soon be S rank in China. It's the perfect counter to someone like the advanced player, right? Kim remarks at how easy it was to get into the forest village. Walking with Xi'an and a young party member through the eerily moonlit woods. Pretty soon the boss would regenerate, and they would have a good fight on their hands taking it down. Oh please, we know how this is gonna end. But unbeknownst to Kim and friends, a fourth person is tailing them through the area. One with a devious, devilish smile of pearly whites. Kim turns around to the newbie, completely missing the creepy guy, and the boy introduces himself as Gamun Park. He's the supporter there with them to pick up any drops that the boss fight may yield, as everything can be sold for straight cash. Depending on current value, it's around 3,000 won per item. Kim asks where the hell drops are used and gets a look of pity after. Figures someone like him who's always carefree couldn't understand. The drops are used in weapon and armor forging. Park pipes up with the question to the player himself. Would Kim mind if he did a recording of this boss takedown? Kim says yes, he'll allow it for a ratio split of 8 to 2 on the ad revenue. Evil bastard. While they crawl the forest looking for the boss room, Xi'an hands Kim a map to take with him. Kim only looks at it while his friend explains that the forest village is no different than a maze. Discarding the map, Kim yells at Park to make a good recording of this and raises his fist toward the trees directly ahead, where a glowing purple light is being emitted from. With a drawn back arm and mighty swing, Kim punches with all muscle and destroys everything in his path with one swing. Goodbye trees, hello easy way out. At the end of his punch, the boss monster, the twin-headed ogre, awaits at the dungeon's finale. Kim excitedly makes a run for the boss while both Shihun and Park thinks he's absolutely mad, both in strength and personality. He just made his way all the way through the maze to the boss area with one punch. Can you get any stronger? And as per usual for our boy, Kim leaps through the air like it's another Tuesday morning and one-shots the boss with a massive kicked blow to the head. He stands atop the defeated boss, having done all of this in under a minute. The wind from his hit blows leaves asunder all around the area, and behind both Park and Xi'an, the stranger sits atop the branches of a tree in silence, just watching menacingly. Returning to his masters in the Ares Guild, Chun Kang Xin is questioned on Kim's performance and if he's really as good as the rumors say. Short answer? Yes. Yes he is. Pure physical strength without the use of magic nor skills, he managed to beat a boss single-handedly. Chun actually admires him on some level but in true antagonistic fashion, also sees a good opportunity to prove himself. 
Why do you gotta be like this? Anything that Kim isn't capable of, he wants to know. The executive chief informs him that according to their intelligence, Kim will be going to the Visible Swamp next, an Ares-managed dungeon. Chun sees this as the perfect chance to jump on and prepare a little welcome for him. True to word, Kim arrives at his final destination the next morning. This is the last boss he needs to hunt to fulfill the list requirement. Upon entry, he gets a really unpleasant feeling, almost as if someone is waiting for him. But a text from Soyeon is enough to distract him from it. Kim shouldn't forget what she told him yesterday about Ares, and above all else, he shouldn't stir any trouble. Flashing back to yesterday, oh, these perspective skips are a pain to keep track of. Kim is in a restaurant with his lovely friend Soyeon, the blue-haired beauty who treats him like an older brother. She point-blank asks why he wants to go to the Ares-managed territory, only getting the reply that he has business to take care of. When pushed for more information, Kim gets a little nervous at her tone and says she'll know when the time comes. Yeah, trust me boys, you don't want to piss off a busy woman like this. Soyeon hopes to dear god he isn't doing this just to poke the Ares guild where the sun don't shine. Kim concedes a bit and says yes, that too, just a little bit. Yeon's adorable face goes from strict and worried mother to defeat in seconds, as she seems to realize that she just won't win while arguing with him. But whatever he does, his trip should be hasty unless he wants to butt heads with the guild on their own turf. Uh, about that. Standing in front of the advanced player while hurling insults and shivering, the remaining Ares Gate guards try to scare him off with the guild name. Kim is really getting annoyed at this unchanging repertoire by now. The same arrogance, the same annoying pattern. When the members of the guild wet themselves in fear or have a midlife crisis, they yell their influential name like it's a get out free card. It's getting all too familiar from beginning to end and grinding his nerves. Out of sheer arrogance, the guy attacks the protagonist. It ends as well as you think. Kim makes his way into the swamp from there, and waiting for him quite a way in was the final boss he needed, the Mega Alligator. Kim remembers something else Yun told him during the outing. Parts of this beast, namely the leather and teeth, sell for a high amount as they possess anti-magic qualities. He easily ignores the alligator's attempts to intimidate him, and one punch later, it… survives? Congratulations bro. Upon hearing that he intends to take its skin and teeth, the boss is having none of this garbage and makes a run for its life. Unfortunately for it, Kim enjoys a bit of torture and swings the poor gator around like a cartoon character. As it hits the mountainside, the gator decides it's had enough of this and turns to Kim with full force to roll intimidation again. It fails abysmally. Kim is excited that it wants to challenge him, but when moving to dodge the jaws of this gigantic beast, he can't move. Some kind of glowing red chain appears around his legs, locking his legs together. Chon whispers to himself, Die, Kim Hyunwoo. Kim dodges the attack regardless of the chains, jumping out of its way with a hairbreadth to spare. He asks aloud what the hell these stupid chains are, and gets an answer from the one who cast them. They are his perfect skill. The man only introduces himself as someone important sent by the Ares Guild to observe him. Two and two fit together, letting Kim easily figure out this is an attempted assassination. Chun is really impressed with how Kim swung around the alligator like it was a toy, even more so by the beheading of the twin head ogre from the forest village. However, there isn't a damn thing he can do against these invulnerable magic chains. No matter what Kim does, the chain on his arms doesn't move at all. If Kim wants to get out of the magic chains, he needs stronger magic than the A rank that Chun is. But Kim has zero magic because of all the time spent in the tower. For a split second, it seems like Kim is finally getting concerned at his predicament. But a second or two later, he just seems confused that the guy is talking to him. He's the protagonist. There isn't any bull tactic you can pull on plot armor. Good luck. Everything Kim says seems to peeve off his jailer more. Chun eventually tries to rationalize his praise lax behavior by chalking it up to calm fever. Kim is trying to act calm to look tough and collected, but surely even the great advanced player has to be worried at this point. Oh boy. Chun gets sick of his attitude at this point and just goes for the throat with his blade, using both high tier skills, poison, and explosion, which do… absolutely freaking nothing. Called it. Kim is just tired of this garbage by this point, so when Chun attacks again, he practically walks into the waiting fist which sends him into a… really somehow sturdy tree. At about Mach 9. If only they made dungeon walls out of that. Chun had made the most rookie mistake of his life, not tying up Kim's whole body with the chains. It seems the expert mercenary didn't expect something so simple to ruin his chances. Devil in the details, brother. The chain suddenly came loose partway through Chun's attack giving Kim more than enough leeway to counterattack. As they fade from existence, Kim kicks the assassin straight in the stomach and uproots the poor tree while doing so. 
How hard is that damn wood? He picks up the fallen tree with Chun still embedded in the bark and asks him, Since you came to kill me, you've made your resolve, right? The poor alligator is drifting along in the swampy waters, still reeling from the hits it was given earlier. A shadow falls over the waters and as it looks up with eyes of abstract pain, the entire tree lands on its back and utterly destroys what is left of the health bar. The gator floats up from the water, utterly defeated from the force of the impact. I wonder how the damage stats are calculated. A notification tells Kim that he's completed the required hunting for his attestation, and the lowest rank is being unlocked. Back in the Ares Guild, it comes as a large shock to the executive chief that Chun Kang is dead in the water. The tree he was pinned to had sank into the swamp before they could get to him, leaving nothing behind to confirm a corpse. The monsters within the swamp probably ate him without leaving a trace. If Kim Hyun Woo managed to beat someone like Chun Kang, who is soon to be an S-rank hunter in China, all he can say to this development is the S-word. But I don't fancy getting demonetized. YouTube, please. Now resting at ease and at home, Kim calls upon his status window to reveal his new skill, status authority, at the lowest rank. The system is apparently inviting him to… something. It will call upon him at midnight that evening so he'd better go prepared. Shiyun comes home and Kim asks him to stay where he is for a moment deciding no time like the present to test this brand new skill, the whoosh. An info screen about Xion pops up and tells Kim everything he already knows. He quietly looks at it for a moment before going into full-on rage about how useless this is, scaring poor Xion within an inch of his life. After apologizing and making it up to his friend, Kim has no choice but to sit and wait for the system to summon him at midnight. Maybe he can finally get some detailed answers about what the hell had kept him within the tower for all these years. And right on cue, as the midnight bell tolls, the room blacks out and Kim is summoned with a huge flash of light. Kim looks around the room at its white brick walls, before inevitably noticing the person sitting across from him. The girl gives him a cursory monotone greeting, stating that it is nice to finally meet the Guardian. Her name is A.V. and she would be his assistant from then on. Okay then? The girl states that as long as he is alive, they would be seeing each other often, after waiting a minute or two for her to say something, he's getting a bit annoyed. I mean, they could just sit here and stare at each other until one of them drops dead, but Kim has a better idea. Cake anyone? Anyway, he asks if she's going to give him an explanation or not, but A.V. seems more confused than anything. Kim springs out of his chair and point blank asks if she invited him there to tell him something or what. A.V. says that she can give answers but needs a question. So Kim thinks for a little while. He then prompts her for the name of who trapped him in the darned tower. AV only takes a second to reply, stating his status scan is too low level for her to answer. Every question he asks gets the same reply. Basically, access denied. In an eventual pang of anger, he smashes her on the head with his fist. Deny this, you little annoyance. Understandably, Kim throws a flurry of questions at her since she's not telling him anything. Surely she didn't bring him here to just mess with him, right? For her sake, I hope so. She angrily reiterates the point that he's too low to get those answers, but before he can take another swing, A.V. is finally useful in telling Kim how to raise his level. As of present, he is nothing but a temporary guardian. In order to get the job, he will wait 5 days until a rift has opened in the city. And the deepest part of this rift is a key that will prove his worth. If he can get it, he will finally start receiving more worthwhile answers. Kim is sent back home with this new knowledge and the will to do whatever it takes to get the answers he seeks. Asking his friends about it the next day, all three guildmasters seem shocked to heck and gone that he'd want to know about something as cataclysmic as a rift. The answer he gets chills Kim to the core. A rift means impending doom. After another embarrassing defeat, the executive chief and personnel director have no choice but to report the loss of Chun Kang to the branch manager, who has broken a table in frustration. The manager seems to understand that although they sent out the strongest person they had, Kim was just too good for him. The executive chief can't be faulted for this. So instead, he turns to the personnel director and says, I quote, If there's a way to make this man pay, then spare no expense to make it happen. The director is to find his manager some mercenaries, ones who are stronger than the previous guy. He really seems to want Kim dead. Guess a blow to their pride was to push over the edge this guy needed. And when he's finished with Kim, they will turn their attention to the Pado Guild's massed special forces who have been removing Ares members from China left, right, diagonal even. While these plans are made, Kim and friends are out enjoying a nice meal, the precursor to him asking about the rift. So Kwon Han, one of the guildmasters, is showing Kim a little ring that is worth 2 million won, 
about 1.8 million US dollars. The tiny ring is an artifact taken from one of the labyrinths around the city. The difference is that dungeons provide special crafting materials to forge things or a place to farm magical stones, whereas labyrinth treasures from vaults are already enchanted and powerful, similar to what you'd find in a game. Thank you, Captain Obvious. As if the menus all manhua weren't enough of a giveaway. The status scan can also check this little ring, but as we've come to expect from it, nothing useful is gleamed as everything is redacted. When Kim is done with everything, he may want to head down into a dungeon to get a few pieces of his own like this. After ordering one of everything off of the menu, guess his power isn't the only thing that's endless, we go full circle as he questions them on what the heck a rift is. Essentially, it's a great canyon that opens and spews out endless monsters until its boss is defeated. The people in both China and Germany who have witnessed such a thing aptly call it Hell's Gate. He then asks them what do they think would happen if a rift suddenly appeared in Korea. Everyone freezes while thinking of an appropriate answer. <gasps> they could in theory stop it, but even a lowly sea rank rift would turn the entire area around itself into a desolate wasteland. A few guilds would join theirs in an attempt to fend off the creatures, but the Ares guild would likely send a group of nobodies and say they were helping. Kim straight up tells his friend to eat a lot and rest for the next four days. They look at him concerned, but only get a reply that they'll know what he's talking about soon. And sure enough, just as AV had predicted, a rift begins to open four days later in the middle of their city's large airport. A plane makes it into the sky just in time to avoid the calamity, but those on the ground aren't so lucky as beasts of all sizes begin to howl from below. An acolyte glides through dark stone hallways lit by purple flames, headed for the chamber of his master. Upon arrival, he only mentions that the ninth class has finally awoken. Not fully, but it will not be long now until they take on their specific duties. His master seems pleased to see what Kim hyun -woo can do to amuse them. As the crowds fall to the airport floor from the intense earthquake, the runway splits in half, pouring out monster hordes the likes of which Korea has never seen. A news chopper takes the scene live, as first hunter groups arrive to deal with the imminent threat. Many tremble in fear before the might of these large, scary beings, but commanders yell to not falter, as that will be the deciding factor that may get you killed. A rookie stares in fear at the wolf being before him, prompting the leading officer to restrain it with a skill and eliminate the beast. The hunters fend them off as long as they're able, but outnumbered by 10 to 1. A scream draws everyone's attention as a giant red skeleton with glowing eyes and a weapon walks out of the destroyed airport, raising its club to strike. The monster is ranked A+, and for good reason. With a single swing, one of the shield bearers is sent crashing into a nearby car, not only destroying it, but allowing the beast to get closer. It raises its club for a second strike, and has its head split in two by Kim, who lands as if he were just on a quick afternoon walk. The monster's carcass begins to disappear, and the commander runs to his fallen comrade, thanking whatever deity internally that he's alive and saved by advanced player. The cavalry had arrived. Everyone ogling at him doesn't seem to realize that there are still monsters present and surrounding them. The group quickly defends themselves while Kim remarks how hideous it is seeing this many monsters in one place. While he should really go to the end and take care of this once and for all, he can give the runts a hand first. With brute strength, he lifts the skeleton's fallen weapon, smashing monsters left and right, again leaving the groups in awe of his pure power and ability. He quickly makes his way inside the airport, leaving the rest of these monsters to the defenders while he tackles the source. They aren't too pleased at being left behind, but have no choice except to hold out for support. The group is quickly getting exhausted and there doesn't seem to be an end in sight for them. But very shortly do they find an experienced swordsman cutting through wave after wave of these creeps. Xiyun and the Soul Guild have arrived, and he isn't the only one to bring back up. Lightning magic rips and tears through the ranks behind the group, the beautiful Yon making an appearance with orbs of electricity at her command. And last but certainly not least, the Uncle Sokwon also arrives with a battalion of knights to back them up. The leaders look around for Kim, but are quickly informed that he's made his way inside already. With a mighty roar, Sol Kwon charges into battle, and rams through the nearest enemies with blinding speed. Despite being dressed as a block of tungsten, the monsters that come for Xion quickly find themselves without blood nor limbs, and none dare approach Yun Li as she deep fries anything around her in thick coats of lightning and thunder. Meanwhile, Kim is wondering about the best way to get down into the depths of this Grand Canyon, while monsters just keep climbing the cliff face from a thin ramp. Seeing a nearby car, Kim goes over and simply rips its doors off their hinges, using these as improvised shields to survive the landing. He runs forward and leaps feet first into the endless void below, 
landing on a few poor goblins and other monsters in the process. Having way too much fun with his power, he proceeds to absolutely wreck everything standing in his way, smacking them headlong off the cliffside and back from whence they came. Be gone, demons! When one of them hits the ground not too far down and the thud echoes upward toward him, Kim throws the doors away and just keeps leaping down deeper into the void. He finally hits pay dirt by landing on a small mountain of corpses of the monsters he'd thrown back into the depths of the Hellgate. Stepping down from this, he finally meets the boss of this little area, the crimson demon, Arukiru, and immediately spots the little key jangling at his side. What Kim doesn't expect is this demon being able to dodge his hits. The first one utterly fails and he gets yeeted back into the wall for the first time in the series. When he looks up, the demon is already closing in with a striking punch. He dodges the attack and kicks this shiny red idiot in the head, sending it reeling backward. It tries to say something in what seems to be frustration, but nothing intelligible comes out. Kim just assumes it's the same old stuff they always tout and goes in for a knockout punch. The demon catches his fist and absorbs the impact, using it to spiral Kim back into the wall again. This beast is much stronger than any other monsters he's encountered, and it has a special name attached to it, Climber. It looks like all the stops would have to be pulled for this one, and he'd have to use a skill we've never seen before. Standing up, Kim grabs his attention and goes into a new kind of pose. Back in the tower, he had tried everything there was to escape, including the corny trope of finding enlightenment via martial arts. Say hi to Jinho for me. It was all stuff he had learned from movies, comics, and anime in the end, so it was probably all garbage. But in the end, the stats he'd gained from the tower turned what was fake into something very real and very scary. Once the body has stopped moving, Kim relaxes and scratches his head, glad that nobody was around to see such a cringe-worthy thing. He'd yelled the attack name like something you'd see in a comic or anime. Oh, very funny. Some things are best left forgotten, it seems. Picking up the fallen key, a status window appears, informing him that the initiation is complete. Kim is now a full guardian and would be invited, if you even want to call it that, to the administration office again in about four days. Then he finally hears it, a small buzzing sound very high above him. A red light blinks in through the haze, and a small camera drone flies around above him, taking a live video back to the Ares headquarters. The branch manager frowns at the footage and his colleagues, asking if they really think this is just A grade. Alice says that the documents in front of him are not just analysis results, but the official measurements of his skills from their branch of the Hunters Association. The manager slams his fist down and says they still don't get it. This guy is beyond what they had thought possible thus far. Taking a moment to collect himself, the manager then turns to a Mr. Yu and tells him to release something special immediately upon completion. Even men like him have their limits. The next day at the Hunters Association main branch, journalists ugh, are shooting pictures of the stage and the advanced player receiving an honorary award from the Minister of National Defense. This is supposed to recognize any efforts he made in helping end the rift crisis. But of course, Kim doesn't bother changing his clothes for the occasion. He's standing up there on stage in front of his nation in a tracksuit and slippers. Props to this guy for the confidence. Upon receiving his gifts, they are asked if Hunter Kim needs some new clothing. Kim looks down, looks the minister straight in the eyes, and bluntly says, Don't worry about it. Handling the gracious gifts from the minister and closing the case once more, Kim asks if he is free to go now, and without missing a beat, he leaps off the stage and into the crowds. Paparazzi capture everything on camera. The minister is absolutely furious at the ignorance and bliss of this little runt with no manners, but it's not like anything could stop him. Meanwhile, somewhere in the outskirts of the capital of China, Beijing, in the heart of the Pado Guild, who I will now refer to as the Mighty Ruler Guild, someone watches Kim's footage with a shaking body, and surprise evident in their stance. The movements he uses are recognized by this person with shock in their beautiful crimson eyes. The leader of the Mighty Rulers asks in admiration for his name, to which a servant replies, Kim Hyun Woo, who had recently escaped from the tutorial tower located somewhere within Korea. She repeats the name on her tongue and instructs her servant to find out everything there is about this man, every detail of his past to the present day, leave nothing out. Creepy stalker lady detected. While this mysterious woman is climbing out the bath, another subordinate comes to bring her news of their subjugation of the Weon Guild. They had successfully taken control of all the regions in the southern region of China. There had been some conflict with the Ares Guild, and regrettably, one of their executive members was captured. Rather bluntly, the woman says that anyone captured who could not make their way back alone was not a valued part of the mighty rulers. They would need to get a move on though. 
It was shameful that they were finding it so hard to capitalize the dungeons within their own darn territory. But these were small prices to pay to keep her oath. Crazy alert. Back in Korea, Yeon sighs in exasperation while lecturing Kim on just how famous he's become. He's quite the public figure by now as Sol Kwon laughs, though Shi Hyun tempers the statement with an ode of caution. His predicament and current enemies, the biggest of which are the public media and the Ares Guild, should not be taken lightly. The headlines of almost every tabloid out in Korea have the same tune, him. Kim's ears quickly ring with reasons why he can't just grab his awards from a ceremony and walk out like that, courtesy of Yeon and Shiyun. He brazenly shrugs them off because it's not like he'd ever be seeing such people again. He's just gonna live the way he wants and let that be the end of it. Ugh, I think he's been in that tower a bit too long. This isn't the early 2000s anymore. Yeon face palms with the little sister disappointment complex, while Kim stands and stretches his legs a bit, telling them that he's gotta run as he has a date. No you freaking don't. While they're all surprised that Hyun Woo has friends, let alone a girlfriend, oof. In reality, he's escaping before his forced teleportation to AV. With a giant burst of glowing light from the alleyway he stands in, Kim is brought once again in front of his little annoyance of an assistant who greets him better this time. It seems she's learned a few manners. The good news for him is that his rank did raise from collecting the key. The bad news, it went from lowest rank to low. Poor AV is the klutz who has to explain that his information access has stayed the same. Like we saw last time, Kim is very unappeased that he can't get any answers. AV quickly explains that this isn't her doing. She's only telling him what she was ordered to. When asked who the fluff taught her such things, she replies that it was the system itself, while his abilities have pretty much stayed the same. That rage isn't good for your heart, my bro. AV is now to tell him what he could do to raise his level further. Now that he is done proving himself, Kim will have to stop all the climbers of the tower. He asked what they are because he'd never heard anything about them in his 12 year timeout. But AV, much to his surprise, is not referencing the tutorial tower. No, instead she is talking about the Tower of 12, of which Earth makes up the ninth layer. That's right ladies and gentlemen, Kim Hyun Woo is now an official superhero. His task as a guardian is to defend the Earth itself from the climbers. Oh heck things just got real. And the protagonist is not very happy with this development. I mean, who would be? Yet again, he's been told to be a good boy, keep quiet, and do as he's told. The only thing he wants is to get back at whoever it was that trapped him in that tower. So why does the list of stuff he has on the to-do list keep increasing? But if he doesn't destroy the climbers, the ninth layer will be completely destroyed, and he will perish along with the home he loves. When Kim straight up asks if he's to just follow orders, AV backpedals and tries to pick her words carefully. I doubt she wants another smash on the head. He tells her to stop mincing up the wording and give it to him. The tiny girl builds up a bit of her courage that comes with her rank, assertively speaking his name, but she very quickly finds this a bad idea by his lack of any fear. So instead she tries another angle, saying the fact that they selected him as a guardian was for his own good in the end, and there would be rewards alongside his achievements, increasing in value the more climbers are defeated. Kim takes a pause to think, calming down to rational levels for a little. Eventually, he pulls the smart move and asks what level his status scan needs to be for the information he wants. Evie answers immediately that he needs to be at least a level of high. I sincerely hope that means 420 points. And by taking down the climbers, he'll eventually get where he wants to go. There's just a few extra steps. And while AV cannot answer exactly how many he'd need to take down, about 5 high level climbers will get him the information. The crimson demon he fought was likely a low level climber. After being returned to the city with his knowledge, Kim thinks back on all he's just learned. Our man here don't care about no world that needs saving, nor earth existing inside the tower. All he needs to know is that he can work his way up and kick the daylights out of whatever put him in the torturous tutorial zone. He's broken from those thoughts by a phone call from Soyeon. The beauty tells him to turn on the TV and flip to a news channel. Right the fluff now. He's in big trouble, for according to the channel he's turned into, Kim has apparently murdered a valued member of the infamous Ares Guild. Oh, you sons of. The next morning, they are at Sokwon's place, and the non stop buzzing of their phones amazes our big hero. Yeon asks loudly what he thinks caused all the commotion, as he was already famous from the 12 year tower escape. Entire countries started paying attention after he single handedly cleared the rift. And with the accusations of murder now coming out, Yeon has been anxious since he first mentioned crossing the Ares. When he makes the mistake of telling her to calm down, the woman just goes into even more of a rage, telling him he's acting as if he were still in the darn tower. This thing ain't on autopilot, son. 
Kim quietly feels like he's getting scolded by his wife, even though he's never had one, let alone a girlfriend. Told you so. Considering for a moment how much she worries over him, the man gets some serious nerve and asks, I quote, Do you like me? Someone get the blast shields, because this woman is about to go nuclear. And right on cue, there's the lightning. She's done playing with him and dares the man to make one more joke like that. Kim does the smart thing and backs down from the raging blue beauty, finally realizing he'll get killed for saying stuff so freely. Shiyun stands up and grabs his phone, showing just how many missed calls he's gotten by this point. Even online search results have pushed the four of their names to the top. He shares one of the various articles on the subject, talking about how the Ares Guild had sustained victims and damage with the fall of Chunkang. Kim still can't understand the glare his old friend is giving him. At this point, Kim asks Sokwon what time the press conference will be ready, and he says that they could start in about 30 minutes if he's ready. This shocks Shiyun and Yeon back to life, who ask what the heck he's planning to do with the gathered massive media outlets. <gasps> Kim looks at them a little dumbfounded and asks if they really think that low of him, that he'd bring together something this big without any sort of plan. They really show their colors here with details of what he may do. It's a bit depressing for the poor guy, but in all fairness, he did start a personal grudge with the most powerful guild in Korea. Back in the Korean HQ of said guild, the branch manager drums his fingers on a table. Everything is going according to plan thus far. The media lapped up the false story they sent out with no questions asked, and the news covered the incident last night on national TV. As an added bonus, there will be a live press conference streamed by Kim himself sometime soon that day. But judging by the current public reception, even Hyunwoo won't find it easy to wiggle his way out of the public rage. The manager smirks to himself. Finally, they have the upper hand on this menace. The only way to keep it is to remain one step ahead of him at all times, as he who strikes first will win the fight. Sitting in the center seat of attention, a room of reporters stares at his lips, awaiting the reaction they hope for. A few questions are yelled as a start, such as why he attacks the Ares Guild and what he thinks about them. In a little twist, Kim loudly and almost proudly states that he doesn't know how things like this work, so he'll just do it his own way. The first guy he answers rather bluntly. He feels, er, even the translator couldn't get that part, apparently. Another asks if it's true that he murdered an Ares Guild member, and surprisingly, he answers truthfully with yes, though he'd like to explain himself before they cast harsh judgment. To be honest, he's not even aware of why such a guild as the great and powerful Ares would do such a thing to him, a lowly hunter who had just come out of the tutorial tower not long ago. There was that time he'd refused the offer from their secret little scout, Alice, but to think they'd act so harshly against him for just a mere rejection is unthinkable, right? Clever son of a... Well, yeah, of course it's unthinkable. What would it do to the reputation? I'd wager the same thing as the audio recording he started playing of Chun Kang's final moments during their battle. The guy foolishly admitting he's an assassin sent by the Ares Guild. The recording goes on and on through their entire conversation, easily painting a picture of how brutal the Ares mindset is. Seems Kim royally flushed them here because I don't see a chance in heck that Ares could claw their way out of this one. But that guy seems to when he suggests that this may be a fake recording. So you know what the protagonist pulls out next to shock the entire room? Chun Kang's phone. Laying out his trump card, Kim says that he couldn't confirm much of anything at that moment due to the device being locked by passcode, but he's positive a quick check by the companies that made it would say everything. But for the meantime, it was his turn to ask some good questions to stump these fools. What was he supposed to do in the face of such a big foe, just sit back and take the punches? He was defending himself against a threat, and fought for his own survival while Chun Kang failed to notice the gator sneaking up behind him. The mercenary tackled with the boss solo instead and viciously lost his life during the process. A wide-eared reporter puts two and two together, saying that Kim had just admitted to murdering Chun Kang. While that is true, it was more set out of guilt over what happened, as Chun's carelessness is what killed him. The media laps this up with several keyboards clattering away in the background whilst Kim keeps them entertained, dancing around with his words to keep the hungry wolves fed. He'd often heard just how amazing a place Ares truly was, so he was more than willing to move past this incident quietly. That's a load of BS. But he wasn't aware of just how big a toilet storm he'd caused by doing such things. I mean, he had lived 12 years in the past where news media wasn't everywhere, so that part is at the very least believable. And while walking out of that soul-sucking conference later that day, Kim is rightfully smug. What he had given the reporters was a massive glaring excuse to poke holes in the pride and joy of the Ares Guild persona, the one they had been building as a brand in the Korean landscape and across the world. All of it down the drain because of one lame trick, a simple recorded audio that the clever hunter had the foresight to make. Yep, yeah, Lady Karma came knocking and she brought a freaking sledgehammer. The Ares chief had only thought of him as a man who obtained strength and no brain with it, but boy did that come back to bite him in the butt. 
but now this is apparently a more personal endeavor to make Kim pay for the crime of insulting them. And this is so pathetic, I can't read more of it. Once leaving for home with Xi'an later that night, Kim decided to go for a walk but oddly tells his comrade not to follow behind for any reason. Xi'an is a little perplexed but not too worried since his old friend is able to take care of himself just fine. And as per the walk down a lonely alleyway, Kim has to hand it to the people following him. To think they would take the split second he's alone to appear and cause a bit of trouble, they uh, they don't make it very far into combat. Striking at his body parts with all their blades at once, every single one stops on contact with the skin. The men are bewildered by their failure to make even a dent on Kim, and when they're done with those oversized back scratchers, he takes them out one by one and still has time to spare. Kim grabs the last walking guy by the collar of his robe, making the man beg for mercy and forgiveness from the protagonist. You just tried to kill him, idiot. You're lucky he needs something from you. If the moron wants to live, then he'll guide Kim to their secret little hideout, where a certain someone is waiting for him. And outside said underground bunker, two guards are idly chatting away while they do their jobs. This place is being constructed at quite the fast pace, the guild working hard to get it up and running. The money used for it is all from quite corrupt sources. While the two yap on the topic of a celebrity coming in today is brought up, supposedly it's that advanced player the news has not been shutting up about. They would like to imagine him being dragged along, only for him to land right beside them and shake the entire structure like a bomb. Yes, this was the place, and that high-ranked team that was supposed to capture him, well, their only remaining member is begging for his bloody life, held by an iron grip. Be glad he didn't hear your conversation, I guess. Knowing how to make quite the flashy entrance, he kicks the elevator out of commission and jumps down the shaft instead, surprising a room full of armed and not-so-dangerous people. When prompted for who he is, Kim only replies with, The Grim Reaper, who will send you to the afterlife. Oh neat, give Rogue and Johnny my regards. While he beats the snot out of those goons in another part of the bunker, the Ares branch manager we've come to know and hate is busy torturing a member of the Pado guild for information. Yet even when her guild has abandoned her, she refuses to say anything at all. This drives the branch manager up the wall. The guy literally sees red and orders that she be taken back to her cell. It's better for her to know what it's like to die if she's not going to be of any use. They should make sure to break her down properly, since it doesn't seem like she'll give them anything. But before they can get to her, the manager's 7pm appointment arrives with some hefty knocks on the door, or what remains of it once the metal is kicked off its frame. The manager now has a choice to make. Does Kim get to beat him to death and bury him, or will they sit down for a nice lengthy conversation? Ah, there it is. The look of fear I've wanted on this man's face. Not so high and mighty in person, are you? One of the guards in the room doesn't seem to get the memo or have eyes, since he attacks Kim then and there despite the hallway of corpses trailing all the way back from the entrance. One easy thwack later and that person is rectified. At this point, the manager becomes certain that if he fights, he will die. Why? Because every single guard in this building were B plus rank, and most mercenaries were at least A plus rank while the team sent to retrieve Kim were on the verge of becoming S ranks. Yet not a single one could take him on. He'd even wanted to believe the boss of that chasm was low ranked, but nope. Kim is easily a high S rank. You don't freaking say. Kim retakes the attention of the room with the usual sassy words asking if this guy was as deaf as he seemed. I laugh, they all have hearing problems. The branch manager should make up his darn mind already. Was he going to get beaten and buried, or were they going to sit and talk? Oh, the confidence oozing off this guy is great. Even though the manager calls him a few dirty names and his knee jerk is to the right, he has the sensibility and restraint to choose the diplomatic option. Information gathering should come first of all is his take on things, but our boy seems to have other plans, because the first thing brought up is compensation. That's right. For all the trouble that Ares' guilt has caused, everything from the assassins to the social media scam they had tried to pull against him, monetary damage comp of 10 million US dollars, alongside a few low-level dungeons they have. After an outburst of rage at how ludicrous that proposition sounds, Kim states it's more than fair. I think so too. But if it's money he wants, why did he reject the Ares' guild offer to join the ranks of their best? If he simply wants prestige, the offer to join Ares was still there, as this relationship of bad blood they have against each other serves no purpose. They could instead benefit from working together and get Kim whatever he wanted in return for his services. Instead, Kim rejects again and adds the girl behind him to the list of compensation along with $500,000 for wasting his time. He doesn't give a flying fluff about Ares nor what they want, and from all this negotiating, he walks home to a very surprised Xiun asking who the heck that girl on his back is. Before continuing, we have the obligatory jump to a rather edgy man making his way toward a huge tower amongst a world laying in ruins, remarking something about the ninth floor. If you recall from previous episode, that's us. 
But in the meantime, Kim now has to explain to Xi'an how he got $11 million in compensation, the rights to four low-level dungeons, and this hostage's compensation. Yeah, good luck with that, buddy. You're going to need it. He also has something on a personal note to ask the woman, so it's for the best that she wakes up soon. But of course, the story wouldn't give us that big convenience, would it? No, nope, because this is decently written. When Xi'an is gone for the day, all the bosses are beginning to respawn, so his time to shine. Kim looks over the beaten woman who lays unconscious on the bed before him, covered in large part by a familiar skull tattoo, just like the skull he had once worn when in the tower. True emptiness comes from first abandoning yourself, is what he had said while carving that mask. Opening the information tab, he gains a little insight about Hong Lin, who quietly sleeps her way through the day, and then hell breaks loose in his mind as a new notification appears. Someone is climbing the ninth floor tunnel towards Earth. He's taken straight to AV with only a 5 second warning. She warns him in person that that person is on the way, the next climber. She brings up the notification panel in silence when asked who's coming and how much time they have, but gets clobbered over the head for her next attempted words. If she had just brought him here to recite what the useless notification did, there was a lot more than just one hit waiting for her. Instead, she had brought him here to give him a stark warning about this next climber. They're stronger than anything he's faced before, and before he could even consider any semblance of a fair fight, even when no such thing exists or ever will, there would be many a thing he'd need to prepare for. He would need to awaken his skills of magic before anything else. Though this person isn't a high rank climber, as you'd need a lot more than magic for one of those, even middle rank would be an uphill battle without the use of such important skills. She manages to squeak out that she can't tell him much of anything else. And Kim accurately sums it up as, a middle rank climber is coming up, but I won't tell you all and I'll just watch as you struggle. Once AV has been thoroughly smashed, on the school you degenerates, She's insistent that he shouldn't keep taking his anger out on her as a fragile little lady just trying to do her job. Then do your job, AV, and give him information required to, you know, save the earth? Didn't his parents teach him not to hit weak woman? Oh. Uh, oh. well that's the sore spot if I ever seen one. Not realizing what she's done until after that fact, AV gets the reply that no, his parents didn't teach him anything. They've been dead since he was a boy. A bittersweet memory, they got killed in a car crash. She bows repeatedly to try and fix her grave mistake but he dismisses it as nothing serious. The first time she's visibly gotten under his skin in this series, and it had to be about the parents. Why you gotta do that to the poor man? Knock off GLaDOS? Moving to the return part, Kim moans endlessly in the Aran Guild's headquarters from within a very large, very intricate magic circle. Soyun calls out for him to not touch the chalk at any blasted cost, as this is a five- wait? No, that- okay. Ahem. <clears throat> This is a magic circle with five billion dollars and the part frustrating Kim so much is that no matter what is done, there's not a single trace of magic in him. It is at this time Xiyun decides to stick his neck in and hand the distraught protagonist some mail, a package of documents regarding the creation of a guild. Both Yun and Xiyun are surprised at the fact that their old friend had established something like this without warning. Now that he has the rights to some of the dungeons, Kim figured that he should actually start doing something with them, even named the guild guardian after a secret job of protecting the earth. Kim turns to Xi'an while he's there and asks if the woman he had brought back was awake yet, the short answer being no. He'll be busy in the meantime trying to figure out ways to gain any form of magical power. And Yun recommends a hunter with a unique talent called Blood Degree from the Japanese Hunters branch. Apparently she can directly inject magic into hunters to upgrade their stats to the next level, but this also means Kim would have to fly all the way out to Japan in order to meet with her. Kim mentions that this is a little annoying and puts his hand down to lean on it, only to slip on the chalk and break the circle. I'll, um, I'll just let Yun's face do the talking here. Five billion dollars, right? The lightning surrounding the building now says yes, rest in peace. And the same can be said for some of the people in Japan as this is going on, for at the very moment, something appears in front of the Japanese labyrinth. That looks a lot like a teleporter to me. Uh oh. Faced with an impossibly strong adversary, Guildmaster Nakagawa, the person Kim and company are going to be looking for, is running around helping people up with her abilities. That is, until the most terrifying opponent makes mincemeat of her comrades in arms. Now faced with the corpses of those who had begged and screamed for help only moments before, she has but a second to consider options before coming face to face with him and getting diced into thundery death. And just when she does, Kim gets a notification that the climber has henceforth reached the ninth floor. He gets a ride for the airport immediately. Meanwhile at the Japanese hunter's branch, Four people, including the supposedly dead Nakagawa, sit at a table and are forced to watch the chaos unfold as Chunma, the climber's name, cuts through everything in his path and more. The saddened guildmaster was able to be revived through an artifact, but her guildmates and the endless slaughtered civilians weren't so lucky. 
but even more of a treat to her eyes is a ray of hope as the advanced player enters view. Standing before Chun Ma without fear despite the man's bizarre appearance and resemblance to feudal Japanese fashion. Being unable to check his status, Kim basically confirms this is the climber he's supposed to fight and gets straight to the point asking what he is. This prompts Chun Ma to attack immediately, swinging the giant blade and sending a blast out. It decimates some nearby rocks but not the protagonist. Wait, where did he go? Oh, that's where. Chun Ma is quick to realize he's about to get decked back to where he came from and is quick enough to block, forcing Kim back and into a range where he can use that strike again. He's certainly fast, but not fast enough that our hero has no chance to dodge the attacks. That's right, attacks. Because this is not just a single cut at him, it's a whole lot of them all at once, done with such a speed that they all blend together. Should one of those hit him proper, he'd be dead on the spot. So instead, Kim will use the range of that attack to his advantage by getting in close where Chun Ma doesn't have a chance to use it. Slamming his fist yet again into the block of a sword, the climber is roughly surprised by the literal gut-wrenching agony of a full-fisted punch from the now-interested protagonist. Realizing that he can't give the guy any distance, Kim rushes back in, but it's too late. The lightning aura of Chun Ma has been released, and it angrily flares, much worse than Yun's earlier rage. Watching from the boardroom, Xiun is tricked, confounded, and downright bamboozled at what he's seeing from the battlefield. Not only did a crevasse open at 2pm, Kim somehow knew about it, he knew and rushed over to Japan whilst Nakagawa and company were awaiting reinforcements, bolting away from the airport and straight for the scene of action from the moment they landed. Wondering what kind of BS skill this was, Chunma outright says this ain't nothing like what they have in this world. With a long distance strike while Kim is running around like a monkey, he attempts to slice the protagonist in half and gets a massive headache for his trouble. Making his enemy lean over from the pain now circulating through his head, Kim takes the chance to use that one skill which obliterated the previous climber the one he'd yelled out and been embarrassed of. One clean hit to the temple later, and he's checking if it had any effects. But no, his ultimate did nothing but knockback damage. Oof. Time for retaliation. A very painful one. Kim tries in vain to close the distance before it's too late, scrambling forward in any sense of the word to get close enough while the guy monologues his evilness for all to hear, and also calls out the attack move like an 8th grader. Shiyun and the meeting room watch in terror as everything in the sword's path is just gone. Every single building, every piece of rubble, everything, it's all gone. All except for Kim who had avoided the majority of the attack by the skin of his teeth, but the graze he got from it was still exceedingly painful. Electricity flows through his veins with the blood and causes more than just cool monochrome effects. It makes a notification pop up. He has unlocked his mana at long fluffing last, and finally, it's getting upgraded. The magic lightning is being forced through his body and jumpstarting whatever the heck magic is made from. If this is the same Chunma who had appeared in countless books and martial arts he had read as a subject, then he's the undisputed king of the castle in his field of study. Kang Jin Ho would like a word with you. But even after seeing the Raiden's blade that Chunma had used to almost kill him, Kim still had ideas of beating him the heck up and taking a victory. Well, yeah, he's got an attitude of magnitude and the pride to go with it. What else did you expect, plasma for brains? Oh, and the magic lightning had pierced Kim's mana veins. All he had previously done in the tower was follow Chunma's movements blindly, not knowing what mana pathways to use for what moves, or even how. But now he gets the awesome benefit of glowy pink wings and a black hole behind him. Somebody in the comments, please explain how the heck this is martial arts. Isn't it about using technique and skill to outwit an opponent stronger than you rather than relying on fancy tricks? Oh well. Since he's gotten a new trick from this dude, he may as well show it off straight away, and end the battle right here and now. Gathering all his magic in one place, Kim ends this with a single strike. He ends this all with a single hit. Getting the kill instantly, we now jump back to the Pado Guild's headquarter and see his student, the leader of her guild, reviewing the video over and over again. Without a shadow of doubt in her mind, this was her master from the tutorial tower. A brief overlook of her history shows her abandonment within the tower, zombies of some kind coming to Om Nom Nom or the pathetic little human, until they weren't. Because looking up at the person who had saved her, Kim stands there with his signature mask, beating the zombies to fleshy, demonic pulps and throwing them around like freaking ragdolls. She asks her subordinates what areas are left in the region for their guild to take, and gets the answer that there's only one left in all of China that they don't own. They would take care of it in a single month for their mistress. But this time, the queen will actually move with her soldiers, because she had sworn while in the tower that on the day her master found a way out of the dreaded nightmare, she would have a well-prepared place suited to his liking. Though she has to hurry, she has to make sure everything is in place so she can go to Korean soil and visit him in person. But before that, Kim walks out of the airport doors and into the hailstorm of camera flashes. Oh fluffing heck, not this again. Ever heard of personal privacy, you- <sighs> Right, family friendly. 
<sighs> what doesn't help his mood nor mine is that they throw endless sets of questions at him and all expect answers. But because he doesn't have anything resembling an answer for any of them, he throws poor Xion under the bus and makes himself scarce. When getting home, he notices that the woman he'd saved, Hung Lin, is up and at him at last and I gotta admit, for that dress, her figure is pretty amazing. Anime bod right there. Sitting her down, he'd quickly learn how formal Hong Lin is and why. As an executive of the most infamous guild in all of China, she'd have to keep her manners about her at all times. But he doesn't give a flying about all that stuff. He only wants to know one thing. Where did the tattoo on her shoulder come from? That's an easy answer at least. It came from the guild master herself, along with the words that woman had said when personally engraving it in Lin's shoulder. Nothing in the world can be above you. There's only one person above you. The sky. Everything else must stay below you. Therefore, you must. His slammed fist on the ground shuts her up immediately. While she didn't make a mistake in her speech, he had a long time ago. When he had 8th grade syndrome. After a few flashbacks of the kinds of things he used to do in the dungeon for training purposes, Kim comes back to reality and basically tells Lin out of sheer embarrassment that whenever she goes back to China, she used to tell her guild leader to never ever come looking for him. Because that guild master had to be his old student from the dungeon the only person in the world who would know the kind of cringeworthy things he had said. But after this, there's one more surprise for this script. For a few days after sending Lin off on her merry way back to the motherland, who else appears on Knowing the Hunter but our hero himself? Yun spits her drink out and Xiyun just melts into his sitting position, leaving Kim on screen to say that because he'd recently created a guild, he'd soon be opening recruitment and if anyone wanted to join, now would be the time. But of course this backfires in the most amusing way possible. Because the very next day, both Kim and Xiyun are standing in front of a full warehouse. Can you guess what it's filled with? Guild applications. Getting his friends to help out with sorting out the endless paperwork in his warehouse of horrors, Kim had promised that they could use his beginner dungeons as payment for their immaculate aid. He's like the only dude who would call guild masters for this. And amongst all the chaos of sorting out papers, Kim also has to deal with all the guild applicants in person to determine who would join him. Many are faced with extreme rejection, as you'd expect from the hothead, but making use of his new skill to check their personalities comes in real handy. He had gotten the extra out of AV when going to see her after defeating the climber last episode, and after she'd congratulated him, the ability popped up in his little menu when using the info authority skill. The notification performance had been improved as well. It had better be unless you want more dents in the school, sweetie. But little did Kim know just how useful it'd be. Now looking over the three newbies in his makeshift office, Kim finally finds the personalities he'd been looking for this entire time. These hunters are overjoyed at being accepted into the guild of the infamous advanced player, given how strict the perceived requirements are. Nah, he's just stupidly lazy. Talking to Xion later, Kim lets out that he'd intentionally been picking out people who wouldn't steal from him by ways of personality. Okay, that's honestly kinda smart. They don't have to be very skilled since he'd be the one doing all the beating up, though it's noted that there were no S-rank volunteers. They were apparently quite a rare sight all around the world, a total of 5,000 in existence. So Yun is 161st, he's 163rd, and So Kwon Hyung, the older gentleman of the guild master, is 175th. Talk about friends in high places, yeesh. Anyone inside the top 200 is recognized, but most die trying to get their hands on ST plus grade artifacts in pursuit of more power. There's apparently a fine line when it comes to ability grades, and you can only progress a maximum of 3 higher than your start. If you begin at C, your highest will be A-. In order to curb this gap, many people go for ST plus artifacts from the depths of the labyrinth, but killing other hunters for them is also an option. Being dropped off at the visible swamp dungeon with the smirk widening, Kim tells his friends to go on ahead. He's gonna destroy the boss and join shortly. I believe the plot has other plans, mate, because waiting for him just beyond the gate of the visible swamp is a strange group who call themselves Pandemonium, Hunter Killers, Meet Le Chakra. These guys are professionals who have all previously made it to the top 100 of the s rank charts, and so long as generous rewards are given on mission completion, they've never once failed an assassination. Until today, that is, because my man got places to be and you're so unkindly in the way. But among all these murderers is a huntress that catches his eye. Is it Ruby Rose? Rest in peace, Monty. No, but it is someone he can make good use of. Anya the Circler. A little back and forth later, he's trapped in a spell and still keeps the attitude at the ready. When she says he should understand the position he's in, big mistake, he already does. I quote, I'm asking so I can figure out if I should kill all of you or not, but you have no patience. This sends shivers down her spine understandably, and the team engages Kim in one heck of a lopsided fight. In his favor, of course. Wonder if his poor slipper survived the onslaught. Speaking of onslaught, somewhere in the bowels of Xi'an, China, 
The strewn about remains of battle are evident within the underground bunker the Pado Guild have just raided. Kim's student has come out on top of everything thrown at her and has the audacity to laugh in the face of the opposition when he mentions stronger forces on the way. That's quite cute, but also extremely unnerving. To end the guy's suffering, she takes a rather familiar stance and pulls the same kind of stuff that Kim had in the crevice. The Overlord's punch decimates what's left of his forces and him, leaving her alone in the scene of carnage and strife. A quick memory of her master's words to not come looking for him makes her envious of Hong Rin, but it's outweighed by her own desire to see him. Definitely Yandere. Crazy, even if she is hot. Can we get a name for her, please? Walking out of the burning building, the little lady takes his words as don't look for me until you have fulfilled your vows. That's gonna be a nasty shock. And now, dragging a certain someone with him, Kim surprises the heck out of Soyeon once more with the person he brought to fix her five... Oh, five billion dollar magic circle. The one that he broke in last episode. Sorry, saying that still causes gears to turn. <laughs> Anyhow, with the small girl getting to work immediately to save her own butt, Yon is further surprised that he slipper slapped the life out of Pandemonium. THE Pandemonium. I can almost see how soft her voice is while processing this. Hmm? Then, as a seemingly innocent gift to his old friend, Kim hands her the staff and robe used by Anya earlier, both S-plus artifacts, and then proceeds to leave to go and, um, repay the Ares Guild for the little present. Better start praying, manager. Slamming the attackers left and right with his toy hammer, I wish I were joking, Kim sends the entirety of the first floor security packing, including some guys who must be prepared to meet their maker. Blocking his way and not helping out their buddies in trouble? That's not very comrade of you boys. Getting a read on the situation from up in his pristine office, the manager listens as his subordinates get pounded to oblivion by a child's plaything. If news got out that they were getting beaten up with such a thing, Ares would lose its face entirely, become a laughing stock. But I think you have bigger problems right now, buddy. Like that, maybe. The manager is bonked back into his nearby bookshelf by a very irate protagonist who's getting rather amused at this little game of cat and mouse. How long had it been since they had talked about compensation for the damages that Ares had caused him? And look what he's gone and done again. Some people just never seem to learn. This time, he wants about 20 billion won. Still, practically nothing in terms of the money Ares has. The manager is more concerned with the fact that Pandemonium was beaten. Kim then scares the life out of him by resting the hammer on his head, saying clearly that every time Ares sends a man after him, he'll come to claim compensation. Better call the hospital now if he doesn't want his subordinates to die on his doorstep. For now, the manager would just have to accept his defeat, even though he now wants Kim dead as a personal vendetta. So petty, bro. Chill out. There is only one person left he could think of to face this nightmare of a man that keeps humiliating Ares. The fifth within the world of the S-ranked, the Emperor Dragon. But before that, something else had to happen. For down on the 8th floor of the Celestial Tower, a new climber is making their way up. The final guardian had lost a bet against her, and as promised, she'd take the final city as sacrifice. With only 5 steps on its floor, everything is destroyed. That… hmm… that's strong. For it to have ended there, this technique may be shortened to the 5 step extermination instead of 10. She and her companions then move to leave, hoping to head up and have even more fun up on the next floor. And climbing back up that tower into the world above, Kim is reading the news about Ares having 47 ambulances called to their head office. The internet eats it up like pancakes with sprinkles and syrup. One guy even working at the store Kim had bought the toy from. And then he notices that it's time for his… lectures? Huh, you wouldn't think that he'd be willing to do something like that. Later that day, during the middle of said lecture, the climber notification finally pops up with a timer ticking down to arrival. Kim is then invited by AV and would be teleported in one hour. He drops the corpse and has the students tag along while he shows how to beat a boss with his bare hands, the woman translating into Chinese for the foreign students. When he's summoned to AV's office, Kim immediately asks why another climber is coming up so soon. It hasn't been long since Chunma and AV is already ordering him around a whole bunch. She says a little of the information authority did accumulate so she'd given him more to work with this time around. The one coming up this time has many comrades with her, but it's not like the Crimson Demon he had first fought. Those were just mobs spawned the crevice to give the demon a boost in conquering the world. This one is a mid-tier and she seems to be one of the above average ones, so he'd have a decent fight on his hands. But the first battle Kim has to fight is that of Soyun as he kicks in her door again, coming to see how the circle is going. Anya was doing her job well, but now he needs her to perform another task, using her unique skill of teleportation to get him somewhere very fast. And where would he be going, you may ask? Why, Germany, of course, courtesy of the notification. Going all the way there with a little editing, we see the climber standing stoutly in front of the army and a hunter glowing green. There's even a big scary tank there. Not like it'll make much difference. She's to surrender and they'd spare her life, but the woman seems so casual it's almost creepy. That's quite a lot of confidence for quite the puny human. But while they do think that they have numbers over her, the woman's companions would also be joining her. And they are a lot scarier than some soldiers. 
We now have a name for her as well, the mysterious God of Chaos. When she finishes her sentence, the creature companions rise and fall on the city, destroying everything in their path while Kim looks through flight menus across the ocean. The average flight time from Seoul to Germany is about 11 hours, and even then there's no guarantee that any airports would be left. Anya is working hard at the helm of her magic circle in preparation to send Kim instantly, though it would still need to take about 5 hours. But while waiting for her to finish, the god of chaos decides to make a bet with the entire world. She'll stay in the city she's raiding for 24 hours, and if someone can take her down within that time, she'll leave quietly. But should they fail to stop her within that time, she will move on to the next city. The head of the German Hunters Association is stressed to hell and gone as he's told the damages, including 20,000 civilian casualties even with the ordered evacuation. The 100 hunters they had sent to deal with this threat, 32 of which were S-rank, are all non-responsive and assumed dead. They've tried asking for help from the top 5 S-ranks in the world, as this is more intense situation than the Japanese crevice earlier that month, but none of them responded. But the phone call he takes gives a single ray of hope in this desolate time. For the backup they are getting instead, is the one and only advanced player. A bright flash of pink and deep indigo magic pour from the sky onto a nearby building, dropping Kim to his destination like a send from God themselves. Might as well be to the people here. Seeing a giant few monsters nearby, the first few unfortunates who approach him begin to annoy the player despite their presence over him. Kim leaps for the nearest one, a giant beetle-like monster, and kicks it so hard across the face that the creature goes tumbling. He then jumps over to the nearest centipede and runs straight up its body, smacking it the fluff up and asking if they're the ones who summoned him. Indeed they were, and the giant thing is now intimidated on where that brat he saw on the TV is at. And from all across Germany, people are beginning to filter into a stream to see the utter chaos in the affected city right now. And who else steps into view of the camera, and the entire world, than the advanced player, taking up mantle of this challenge. Finally standing face to face with the little twerp who dares to intrude upon his green earth, the man himself looks over her childish form with some kind of amusement that his enemy is a kid. So he's the first contender? Yeah. And he's got witty puns to spare. Kim asks if her mouth was the only thing that aged, making the cheapy god of chaos a bit angry at the sheer audacity coming from such a human. He basically dismisses her, asking how she's going to take responsibility for the city she's just ruined, as if he's already won the battle. After gloating about how many steps the last few people have lasted in the face of her ability, she begins the countdown. One step. Two steps. Kim starts to feel the buzzing of the air around him as vibrations pick up, energy condensing and splitting at the seams like it's a cosmic toy. Suddenly, Kim is without breath. It's taken from his lungs by all the mana hung around his body like the world's heaviest weight. Her magic is spreading and encompassing the whole area, beginning to crush everything in its wake. Three steps. Four steps. Five steps. Kim does his best not to get taken out of commission, just barely holding on to dear life while preparing an attack against this annoyance of an inhumane bit. R right monetization. Six steps. Seven steps. Kim cannot control his magic anymore and it begins to spiral out of control, encompassing the area and getting crushed underfoot quite literally. His magic is getting expanded by the sheer force she's putting out. His whole body is now quaking in itself and the pressure this mid-tier climber is exerting. But even with all the world and environment as his disadvantage, Kim pushes through the pain and sorrow to a bright sunny day. He guns for the god of chaos with his current ultimate move from his set. 8 steps. 9 steps. Kim swings a leg over her head trying to knock the runt out cold and she catches it. Kim was unable to stop her. 10 steps. Extermination. The mana in his body is practically bursting at the skin, about to rip his body a new one from the inside out. Yet he endures the harshness and comes out on top of the god's divine abilities through sheer willpower. She's very impressed by his durability to withstand her ultimate technique all the way, taking every bit of damage to the point it only influenced a small area. In the previous floor, that same technique flattened the entire city in just 5 steps. So what you're telling me is that he took the equivalent of a nuclear bomb, crushing down on his soul all at once, and lived? What? I, I don't- uh, 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 Um, need a second. Okay. Though while he did withstand the damage, it wasn't without some form of cost to himself. Kim is at his limit already. Or so she seemed to think. He stands up tall one more time, his tracksuit now ruined almost beyond repair. Maybe that suit is his plot armor. And reminds her that among the choices of him begging for life or waiting for death, there's a third kicking the pants off her and sending the wretch back home from where she came. The deity is very amused by his words, and releases all her magic power as a courtesy for the amusement he's provided thus far, keeping her composure and going all out with the 10 steps against her new rival. But this magic is way denser and way heavier than the stuff he just had to deal with. But a notification alerts that he stopped the mana expansion from happening internally, increasing his durability. He's still growing rapidly despite the pressure. When he finally realized this fight was the same as Chunma, Kim had practically won. 
clearing his head to think of something that could defeat this tiny vixen. He takes inspiration from everything he'd learned in the tutorial tower, be it from anime, manga, any kind of fictional characters. To normal people, they were just that. But when you have the same kind of powers as people such as them, they become masters to learn from. Tens of thousands of masters. Managing to control the flow of his magic once more from the forced injection, Kim calms himself and creates a technique out of thin air, grabbing the god's leg with it to stop her walking. Again and again she tries, getting thwarted each time. But she finally tricks him into the defense, landing the fourth step of her skill and crushing him with pressure once more, concentrating all her magic on his body alone to crush this worm of a human being. But as she lands her fifth step, Kim is directly in her face, at least two heads taller than the tiny being, and halting her with his own form of pressure. She looks up at him shocked, in unbridled awe that someone could withstand this much from her hands and still remain above in terms of power. Yeah, get used to it little lady, if you live long enough to see the next fight. Her stacks did nothing to him this time, and now it's his turn to use the powers of protagonist to bonk her back into the dusty wasteland she came from. Using his own special technique, this is all ended in a single massive blow. It only takes a few seconds for this to be over, a beam of pure light piercing her chest and destroying whatever was left of her soul along with any dreams she may have had of getting to the top of the Celestial Tower. The notifications indicate that he'd successfully captured her. Captured? Okay, probably translation errors or something. And the instant it's all over, he's brought up to AV's office. Through all his efforts, he had earned a fat promotion and could now access more detailed information. Why did AV summon him immediately after the event? Well, she was just happy and wanted to pass the information along. Duh, sometimes the child melts my heart. After the adorable moment has passed, Kim notices the room they stand in is also a lot freaking bigger than before. Evie explains that this is due to him getting upgrades. It directly proportions to his progress and there are many other things that have changed since he became a mid-low tier authority. Another is that he now has the power to decorate the system room however the heck he sees fit. Trying it out for the first time, Kim brings up the very vivid memory he has of the first floor from that tutorial tower. I bet that must be bittersweet, remembering the old place again. Just as Evie had said, soon as he presses the button, poof. She recognizes it instantly and stares in curiosity at the space now transformed before he does it again, this time to Sheehan's apartment for the sake of comfortability. Now, Avi is practically ecstatic with joy because it's the first time she's ever seen the room of a human from the ninth floor. She can't use the button herself and has been in that same room from the date of her creation. She'd even sleep on her desk, alone, when tired. Jesus, isn't that a bit harsh? Now they get back to the meat and potatoes. Kim can not only walk in whenever he wants, answers are now available from AV, such as the reason his real stats don't match those shown on the menu system. When the tower was created, it had a lock put on it, stopping people from rising too high in power. But despite the system lock, his strength has continued to rise, creating a disparity between what was shown and what it currently is. Now there's a lot to cover here since this is a season finale and we don't have enough time in the episode, so I'll briefly touch on it all. Crazy Student has gone through yet another guild and her crazed rampage on readying a throne for her master, all from a promise she had made to him in the tower, not the other way as she implied. Kim had essentially gotten an all expenses paid invitation to move to Germany in return for saving their city from the cataclysmic destruction, and we learn that his cover for going crevice stopping is kicking the snot out of those who think they're hot stuff or the world's strongest. And finally, after 10 long parts, we have come to the end of the first season of the advanced player of the tutorial tower. Yes, I hear you in the comments, that is the full name, enjoy! Now it's time to move into Season 2, where a new artist is drawing the panels. Let's jump into it. Almost two weeks after defeating the God of Chaos, Kim Hyun-woo has gone on the now famous Knowing the Hunter show to say some things about his previous conference with the press, in which he'd made some rather odd statements. They replay the scene in question behind him on the big screen for all cameras to see. When prompted for what the heck kind of skills were used to solve the previous two chasms, he said that those weren't skills, they were moves he himself had created. Though, the advanced player isn't all too happy being used as a marketing point for the martial arts world to gain more cash, and he shows as such. Taking the sword from one of these so-called masters that the show had brought on stage to perform their martial arts, Kim bluntly asks if people who know jack about martial arts would get strong just by learning them. I think the manhwa logic answer to this would be yes. You're our example, mate. But apparently martial arts isn't the reason he's such an overwhelmingly strong hunter in the end. He proves as much by using the same technique the previous martial artist had used, blowing a hole straight through the ceiling of the studio to get the point across that he is the strong one and they are not. A wee bit egotistical, but I guess he's earned the right to be after saving the earth about three times already. Coming back into the office on his phone as always, Kim walks past a cute woman at her desk who turns out to be none other than Anya the Circler. She's completely changed her appearance and demeanor, becoming a skittish working woman in the face of her big scary boss man. He had chose to let her live with him for the sake of convenience, since she's a fairly hard worker at the core, but wouldn't tolerate her running away. 
Though it's meant as a joke, she clearly doesn't take it as one. But Anya has to admit this is a much nicer life than being on the run across the world 24-7. Then a fax arrives with the proper transfer procedures of dungeons from the Ares Guild. Uh-oh. What did that stupid manager do this time around? Apparently, arrive in China seeking help from the last people you would expect from this world, their mortal enemy, the Pado Guild that rules the entire continent, the ones who have been causing them enough trouble to be cautious. But despite the dire necessity, this was the manager's last attempt to get back at Hyunwu, because once the main branch catches on that their dungeon monopoly had been taken away, which they already have, the manager and his team would be considered useless. And that is really, really bad news when it comes to the power-hungry Ares Guild. So the manager comes face to face with his worst nightmare, being granted entrance to see the dragon emperor he sought after. Being taken in through the main entrance, the first thing catching the manager's attention is the woman on the throne in the far end of this room. Wait a second, Kim student is the fifth strongest in the world? What that kind of monster did he create? The manager steps up to her highness and is asked for the name of the person he wants dead. But before he can mutter a thing, there's the overwhelming feeling that he shouldn't say what he's about to. But if he goes back empty handed, he's as good as dead. Oh, ho, ho, buddy. Funny that you think you're going to be leaving in anything except a nice comfy body bag. If she even grants that courtesy for insulting her beloved master. She slowly gets up from her seat, magic flooding the room like a tsunami and forcing the manager back in terror of the horrible, infinitely bad idea he just suggested. Telling a yandere that you want the person they love dead and you want them to do it? Nope. With only a single hit, the man is put back on his knees in front of the woman. He then tries to convince her over the next few minutes of trembling that Kim may not be the master she's been looking for all this time. And for all the effort in the world he'd put in to save his puny life, she just hits him again. How dare this arrogant little worm deny her and her master. This man was going to long for a peaceful death, but unfortunately that's where I'm going to stop. Because while you probably want to know what happens next, I'd prefer my lunch exactly where it is. Cliffhanger time! Thank you so much for watching everybody, we hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment some new manhwas for us to review down below. Goodbye!